They are icons of comedy and an American institution. Three characters that are part of the very fabric of popular culture. I ought to know, one of them was my father. Hello. 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 Just how do you grapple with the fact that the apple never falls far from the tree? Well, it landed with a clunk, slap, plop. When it came to me, my source of frustration was my dad's occupation. He's a stooge. Oh no, he gagged. Hey mo, hey mo, hey mo, hey mo, hey dad. I always hope to be an ordinary Joe, a face in the crowd, John Doe. But just my luck, I'm born son of Mo. I never knock for my father, and it wouldn't be Mo if I had my brothers. And oh, by the way, take a look at his brothers. Hey Mo, hey Mo, hey Mo, hey Mo, hey Dad. My dad was always for real. It hit me with a bonk, boom, crash, is what it took to get me to feel. Well, now I ain't hiding and I'm swelling with pride, along for the ride and glad. So here's the three stooges story in all his knucklehead glory. It ain't just a passing fad. A hemo, hey Larry. During a few short years in the late 1950s, the Three Stooges had enjoyed a remarkable resurrection. They had been yesterday's news. Now they were today's headliners. And with a big new movie career looming on the horizon, for the Stooges, not even the sky was the limit. The race to reach the moon and sun. And we've got half the battle won, half rockets. Oh, we'll travel. And so the Stooges blasted off into cinematic orbit in the sci fi spoof, Have Rocket Will Travel. Do not delay. I am waiting. I am Larry. I am Mo. And I am Curly Joe. Take us to your leader. Well, I remember going to see Have Rocket Will Travel. And I guess I was eight or eight and a half years old, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. So I kind of accepted Curly Joe uh, because uh, that was a, an enjoyable film, and he was good in it. The picture was a modest but promising hit at the box office, and a series of Stooge movies seemed certain. We've done it. You've had it. The end. And it was at this point that Norman, my bright young brother-in-law, really took over as the guiding force of all things Stooges. Norman understood something fundamental about these Latter-day Stooges. He realized that audiences still loved them and that they were a fabulous drawing card. He sensed how strong the bond was between performer and fan and how much the act had endeared itself to its legion of followers. It's interesting to see how the character of the act of the Three Stooges changed with feature films. Larry, where are you? In the 1960s, 
the Three Stooges are in their 60s. They weren't performing at the same pace that they may have performed when they were in their 20s and 30s. The slapstick is still there. It's not quite maybe as prevalent as it was uh, in the 30s and the 40s. Norman felt that presenting them as three helpful surrogates would be more palatable. And I didn't realize at the time how important that was. Yep. At this stage of the game, the boys were better suited as sidekicks than as stars. The comic relief that served the lead while stealing the show. Kind of like uh, the Seven Dwarfs. And so perhaps it was destiny that Norman's first effort as producer landed Moe, Larry, and Curly Joe in a filmic fairy tale for 20th Century Fox in Snow White and the Three Stooges. The ever resilient Stooges, given up for dead just a few years before, were now on display in the splendor of widescreen Technicolor, and sending up Snow White was just the start. Back at Columbia, Moe, Larry, and Curly Joe were soon getting muscled out of the picture by a Greek god in The Three Stooges Meet Hercules. Going back into outer space and the Three Stooges in orbit. And giving Jules Verne a spin in his grave and the Three Stooges go around the world in a daze. And while none of these movies will really ever be confused with Citizen Kane or Casablanca, they did accomplish their primary ambition to entertain grandparents and grandkids alike and to let fans enjoy the company of some beloved old friends. Beloved old friends who finally found their audience once more. In the early 1960s, TV heartthrob Clay Cole hosted an RKO tour of many neighborhood movie theaters in the New York area. This tour brought people together from all nationalities and all walks of life. And to this day, baby boomers fondly remember when the Stooges came to town. Back in 62, the Stooges toured in the tri-state New York area. And of course, I was in the front row and I took this picture of them. And I tried to get the autograph of Mo, but they wouldn't let me because there was too many people around. So I picture slip Mo, I gave him a slip, could you send me a photo? And then about a week or so later, Mo sends me a letter. But when I got the letter, I looked at it, and on the bottom it was only signed Mo. And me being a wise ass kid, I sent it back to him and I said, could you sign Howard on the end? About a week or two later, I got the full letter back with the full signature. I went to see the Three Stooges in person with a throng of other kids. It was Bedlam in the theater, and then out they came. There they were, on stage, unbelievable. What a thrill when they came to your neighborhood movie theater. There they were, just like on TV. And the boys would be returning to those theaters and more movies, too making cameo appearances in Stanley Kramer's mega-comedy It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. After all, how could it be a truly mad, 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 mad world without the Stooges? And in Four for Texas, the trio teamed with those charismatic Rat Packers, Frankie and Dino. I loved the, uh, the movies. I thought they were fantastic as a kid. I was a Stooge fan. I watched the shorts on TV, and when I learned they were coming out on the big screen uh, theatrically, it was a great moment. I was very, very excited. In 1965, the Stooges starred in one last film, the grammatically challenged Western, The Outlaws is Coming, directed by Norman, which featured the clever gimmick of having all those helpful Stooge TV hosts play the villains. We did the scene for Outlaws where you get hit with the pie. So Mo said, on the count of three, I'll whack it with the pie. And I said, OK. He said, well, you look a little, you know, like you're going to you know, do this. We don't want you to do that. So let's count to seven. And it give you time to get into it. I said, OK. 
And he said, one, bang, and then we have it on one. And of course, there was no, you know, pre, <laughs> pre pie you look. This was to be their farewell to features. Hey, fellas, just like in the big budget westerns, we're gonna get the right off into the sunset. But that last roundup on the big screen was hardly the end of the trail for Mo, Larry, and Curly Joe. The comic books continued, and the toys, and the lunch boxes, and all the merchandising mania that goes along with a pop culture phenomenon. There were sold out club dates. They'd go in a setting of a, like a nightclub, a regular nightclub. They went in and took it over on the weekends for youngsters only and did a thing, and then they were sold out there. The kids that were Stooge fans at this time were 8 to 12-year-olds. The kids were having soft drinks and hamburgers, and the Stooges would come. My mother was looking around at the audience, and she realized the expressions on these faces when these kids who had seen the Stooges on television were suddenly these live persons. And she said it was like a look of adulation. She must have turned to somebody next to her and they were conversing. And the woman said, you know, I haven't seen a look on faces like that since I was in Lourdes. I think at that point, my mother realized that there was going to be some kind of resurgence. Hey, fellas, there's a guy here who wants us to make a record. There were LP records featuring songs and skits. That's the rocket man. It's going to be at the fair. What fair? The Los Angeles County Fair. At Pomona. We're going to be there? Yes. And personal appearances that set attendance records across the United States and Canada. Just change that classical bag to some sweet, beautiful drag. They sold out like 60,000 people at the state fair. I mean, they drew really crowds. I know, I know. It sounds a little bit like the Beatles, right down to Moe's mop top. And the comparison is pretty accurate. The Stooges in the 60s were incredibly popular. They were like three rock stars who had made three generations of fans laugh by being rockheads. They had become branded entertainment before anybody had ever heard of such a thing. And Dad and Larry, back from oblivion and awash in adulation, were having the times of their lives. This flood of reclaimed fame and fortune would not have been possible without the likes of Officer Joe Bolton, Don Lamond, and all the other TV hosts. My dad recognized this was always happy to pay Officer Joe a visit in his electronic precinct house. And being a chip off the old stooge blockhead, I was myself hauled into the police station for a chat. Well, Mo, who's the handsome dupe next to you with a gorgeous tie? That's what I'm trying to find out. What happened, uh, what happened here? It must be on the side of my wife. This happens to be my son. Well, it's a joy to have you on the show with Dad. And you know, I think this is the first part tonight. Because uh, Paul was on one time with me, and without, me. Him, without you, and uh, you've been with me so many times, and now it's the first time I've had the father and son together. And really, it's really a joy to have you here. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh -huh. Anyhow, I try to get into the pictures, but each place, he's just... I did a couple when I was young, yeah, and I young. found out that it's a, a profession that takes a lot of skill, a lot of patience, a lot of nerve. And uh, I went in the other direction. Yeah, well, I don't. Incidentally, in case you don't know it, I'll, I'd like to explain to everybody that Paul Howard is a very well known artist in New York. He's uh, with an advertising agency in the art department and is very well uh, thought of. But whether I was happy or not, it was a family obligation, like putting up with obnoxious third cousins at Thanksgiving. Making the television rounds was all part of being a Howard, regardless of generation. Whether you loved it like my dad did, or like me, was a little more neutral on the subject. It just had to be done. Because you see, TV had been instrumental in saving the Stooges. And now, the boys were only too willing to return the favor. 
Now, even though the Stooges had made their names on the big screen, they had never really been strangers to the small one. The trio had tried their luck with a series idea of their own way back in 1949. While Shemp was still the Stooge and TV was still in its infancy, this particular show pilot crashed and burned. What got so far? How do you spell sorrow? In your case, see you are. Continue. But even if their pilot got lost in the clouds, goodbye. goodbye. The Stooges were frequent visitors to TV during the 50s. Who are you? Guess. The McGuire sisters? As the idiot box welcomed America's most famous oh, idiots. The three Stooges! What are you doing in my files? We want to be discovered. But you've already been discovered. I told you he was discovered. Yeah, under a rock. <laughs> Prepare for the double zinger. No, 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 no not, not the, the double, double zinger. zinger. No. <laughs> Executive, Dick. Put your fingers out like that. Now hold your arms out that way. On your mark. Get set. Go. Oh. Oh. You got to do this right. Elegance, poise. You see, hold back a little bit. Now, do you understand? Yes, sir. That's it. Now, here we go, answer the door. Here we go. <laughs> and it was after the great revival of the early 60s, after the success of their old two-reel shorts, hey, let's go places and buy things. Come on. Oh, wait for the money man now. <laughs> and new feature films that the Stooges became a regular fixture on the boob tube, popping up everywhere. The Stooges did their great routines on various variety shows. What is that? A half a dollar. <laughs> These were all great shows that, that uh, were very, very popular at the time. Of course, I watched them anytime they were on TV. I remember them on a, a Francis Langford special. It was a filmed, hour-long variety show. I remember seeing them on the Ed Sullivan show doing the stand-in routine. Uh, I remember seeing them when I was a little older, coming out on Joey Bishop's late-night TV show on ABC. You see, in those high-spirited halcyon days, comedy was television's king. And these three legendary lame brains were its elder statesmen, the poet laureates of preposterous lunacy. What tributaries follow him to Rome? Right. To what? grace and captive bones as chariot Whoa. wheels? Whoa. You blocks! Yeah. You stone! Hey! You... Oh! Smell it. You! <laughs> Aged beetle. <laughs> What are you doing? We've gone legitimate. Why? Yeah, it's our new image. What? We do Shakespeare. Fellas, <laughs> fellas, this is the anatomy of humor. We're making people laugh tonight. I'm sorry, Daniel. We've been in the crummy under this business far too long. <laughs> One more night couldn't hurt you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Make way for the new us. Yes, go ahead. To be! I don't know. I, I didn't study this. Well, you should help me if I got stuck in the night. <laughs> Milton Berle, the dean of TV funny men, had a particular soft spot for the Stooges. And Ed Sullivan and Steve Allen, the deans of TV hosts, were not far behind. in this area of the country, they're going to be opening and headlining at the Palace Theater starting on February 20th. It's been grand of had you in the CEO of the Palace. Thank you. Fellas, you didn't rehearse it that way. You've got to be careful. If you're not careful, somebody's going to get hurt around here. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> You mean you ain't got it? No, we ain't got it, and we need it. We got a big date tonight. It ain't there yet. And the sponsors, the it? uncrowned it? kings of it? broadcasting, saw it? a marketing tool that would appeal to, well, to anybody who liked to laugh. 
I guess there were a few of those folks around because the Stooges were soon selling anything and everything American consumers could possibly pine for. I wonder if you'd be interested in signing up for the payroll savings plan. The payroll savings plan? We found a way to put Simon Ice Car Wax and Simon Ice Car Cleaner all in one push-button can. And just how does it work, Professor Nitwit? Come on, we'll show you. Come on, we'll show you. Come on, we'll... Oh, it's Aquanet hairspray for women and girls. Anyone can give a girl flowers. <laughs> and we want to ask you to support the Arthritis and Rheumatism Foundation and help find a cure. If Dickies can make the Three Stooges look good, imagine how great you'll look. As the years wore on, the Stooges began to morph into animated versions of themselves in a cartoon series produced by Norman called The New Three Stooges. A lot of people found this show to be very clever and very funny. But a stooge in the flesh is usually worth two from a brush. As you get to, to know the real men behind the stooges, you start to see the kindness of them the, you know, in real life, the, the good works that they did. What things did he do for charity? Oh, for example, uh, there was a Spastic Children's Guild out here and other groups. He was president of uh, one of those groups many years ago when they had a charity function and they needed someone to function as MC. He'd come up and tell the most wonderful stories, old stories, and really could crack you up. The Stooges had by now achieved a rare distinction. They had become cherished old pals, a trio of favorite uncles who could always be counted on to be the life of the party. Oh, that's the latest dance step. And sometimes fans got a chance to see more than just the three leading players. Sometimes us family types got into the act. That's what happened on one particular TV occasion I distinctly remember. It was sort of a summit meeting of generational entertainment clans. Art Linkletter's son Jack hosted a get-together featuring the Stooges and those they held near and dear. Well, you fellas My dad's there, story. and you're Mo's wife, and mom, and, uh, and Joni, <laughs> and oh yeah, and Paul. some guy Paul's named Paul. Are. Well, uh, this is my son Paul. Who goes to UCLA? I'll talk to him. Were you ever embarrassed by the this, this no. mad man that you seem to have as a father? I wasn't embarrassed at all. In fact, I was proud, really. Did you ever want to grow up and be a comedian? I tried it, basically. I used to get with the kids, and we used to beat each other around a little bit, but he, he sort of sleeps, eats, feeds, and breathes uh, comedy. I, I don't feel that I really got the old punch, but I've uh, admired him, and I feel that art is my field. Well, that's very good. How about, now, uh, as far as if I'm as uncomfortable as back there in the meet. station house with Officer Joe Bolton, then I looked downright miserable with Jack Linkletter. And that's probably because I was. What was the source of my televised melancholy? Well, this second stage of Stooge success had brought renewed fame and fortune to mom and dad. So that certainly didn't make me unhappy. And it had given my brother-in-law Norman a rewarding and satisfying career. And it would soon give one to my beloved sister, Joan herself. And how could I be anything less than thrilled about that? It wasn't about the success and the celebrity in and of themselves. Instead, it had to do with one simple fact, that my father was assuredly a showman to the core, and I just assuredly was not. He probably would have preferred a son who was just as theatrical and flamboyant as he was. Though he never said it. Dad craved the bright glare of the footlights, while I felt more like a deer caught in the headlights, about to be run over by a Hollywood promotion machine that I neither liked nor understood. It might not have been what I wanted, but boy, oh boy, it's what I got. The years had passed, and the Stooges still hadn't passed into history. I thought they were finished, and it turns out they were just getting started. And now I was back on the hook again, 
back on a runaway horse called the act, back on a runaway train called show business. Lord, how I wish that train would stop and I could get off. But the train wasn't going to stop. And besides, I knew I was in the minority. As the 60s were drawing to a close, my dad settled into his role as stooge emeritus, basking in the affection and admiration earned during a lifetime spent making people feel a little better about things and perhaps a little bit better about themselves. Along with Larry, his pal and partner of what seemed like forever, and the newest stooge, Curly Joe Dorita, my father was now taking delight in what for him really were the golden years. Because by then, the battles had all been won, the bad times had all been overcome, and the bright legacy had all but been assured. Yes, Dad and Larry, the Stooges who had been there since the beginning, since before the beginning, had been on quite a ride. They had enjoyed the best and endured the worst that show business had to offer and had come out just fine on the other side. Rising from anonymity, these sons of immigrants had begun with an act based on the idea that a bunch of guys who needed to be institutionalized had ended up as an American institution. Their names familiar even to people who had never seen a second of their film. But now, Father Time was about to get the last laugh, as he always does. The 60s had been a spectacular. Spectacular 10 years for my dad, Larry and Curly Joe, full of international celebrity and intoxicating success. And on one level, they really were the best of times. But for the lovable Mr. Fine, the sweet soul who was everybody's friend, the professional glory had come at a terrible personal price. The 1960s had barely started when Larry and his wife Mabel suffered the blow that no parent ever should. My mother had a younger brother, Johnny, Johnny Fine. Johnny was very close to my father. I won't say he was his idol, but pretty close. Johnny wanted to follow my dad into the radio business. My wife at the time, Phyllis, called me and said, Johnny's had an accident. And I said, OK, I'll be right there. We went to the hospital. It was not good. So we went outside, and we were sitting there, and all of a sudden, a fellow said, Johnny just died. And I said, well, what? And we got up and went inside, and he had. He was only 24 years old. Larry and Mo and uh, Curly Joe, they were east. They were touring. And I said, I'll make the call toughest call ever had to make. Mabel never really got over that. Larry has always kept up a brave front. Larry sounded like he took it as well as he could. And, and, and I think that was the, the back of Mabel because when she heard it, I heard her scream at the other end of the phone. But those of us who knew him well realized that, like Pagliacci, this heartbroken clown was now hiding his grief behind the gags. Then, less than six years later, on Memorial Day weekend in 1967, Larry was on tour with the Stooges. Mabel had been ill, just not feeling well for a couple of, of weeks. My dad comes home to get ready to go to the TV station to do his TV show. Where's your mother? Mom decided to go over there and, and spend the afternoon with her. The phone rings. Is your dad home? Hello? I see the color in his face completely drain. He says, I'll be right there. My mother had walked in and found her, her mom in the powder room sitting there, and it died between the time she talked to her on the phone and, and she got there. So the next call is to Larry. The phone rang. It was his daughter, Phyllis, in tears, 
telling him that Mabel had suddenly succumbed to a massive heart attack. Larry was never the same after that phone call. I don't think he ever got over her death emotionally. He dealt with it, but it pained him for the rest of his life. He and Mabel may not have had the kind of relationship you read about in romance novels, but in their own unique way, they were intensely devoted and deeply in love. So Mrs. Fine, how long have you had that name, Mrs. Fine? Uh, for th over 33 years. That's a commentary on a side of Hollywood that we don't read about in the papers. All we read about are divorces. Now, that love was gone. As the 60s dragged on, it became harder and harder for Larry to answer the comedy call. But he soldiered on because he was a trooper, playing the stooge and getting the laughs. Even as late as 1969, he joined my dad and Curly Joe on a new TV project an hideous expedition called Kook's Tour. This excursion into the absurd was supposed to follow the Stooges as they took a series of screwy vacations, an idea that no doubt would have set the travel industry back a hundred years. Curly Joe, yeah. please take care of the wood. Larry, please take care of the fire. What are you going to do? Nothing. Don't strain yourself. Oh, come on. But Kook's tour did not depart as scheduled because Larry just wasn't up to the trip. Time, you see, had become his mortal enemy. And as filming wore on, the sun began to set on the stooge in the middle. As the new decade dawned, the light dimmed. Larry, the indispensable second stooge, the man in the middle of all those landmark comedies, was felled by a crippling stroke in the first month of 1970. When he awoke from the coma, he was partially paralyzed, unable to walk at first, or even to speak with Larry now fighting a daunting battle. A long dreaded day had finally arrived. Age and infirmity had done what changing tastes and new technologies and tragic laws had not been able to do. Age and infirmity had at last written the end to the performing career of the Three Stooges. Larry spent months in the hospital, slowly regaining some semblance of his former strength and vitality. Dad visited him frequently. And when Larry took up residence in the motion picture country home, Hollywood's care facility for aging industry professionals, well, Dad visited him there too. They had been friends and partners for decades. They, 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 their families grew up around each other. You know, I mean, the, the connections were many and varied and deep. It was very difficult for Mom. Did you boys associate um, socially? Oh, yeah. We were very friendly. That's why we lasted 42 years. Mo and I are still very good friends. I hope it stays that way, too. And even though Larry was still ailing, the two of them would often mount impromptu shows for the staff and patients, recapturing, if only for a moment, a fleeting reminder of faded glory. It was a last bittersweet collaboration of the two men who had been the heart and soul of the Stooges for so long. Real live Sunshine Boys. With those nostalgic little presentations, a legendary partnership was laid to rest. And now, Dad had the opportunity to kick back once and for all and to be just a husband or a father or a grandfather or whatever else he wanted to be. Did your dad have any particular interests or hobbies? In the later years, he loved to work with pottery. 
and I have a lot of the art objects around my house, wonderful, practical things. And on the back of every piece of artwork that he did, he put a little Mo face, you know, a little cartoon. Right, right. So uh, that makes it kind of neat. Sometimes a simple thing like combing your hair can get to be a habit, a bad habit. He could finally smell the roses instead of the grease paint. But retirement, in the traditional sense, just wasn't Mo's style. The pressure of being a performer had ended, but the pleasure of being in the spotlight <laughs> had not. Do you ever get a chance to see Mo anymore? Where's he? Oh, he's out here, and he's playing colleges. This is a return engagement for me here in Buffalo. I was here in 1892. <laughs> and Stan told me, I'm pretty sure that I'll be returning next winter because he said it'll be a cold day before Mo Howard comes back. When they love you, you can, you can just feel it. And so the love of that feeling, the pursuit of that feeling, the acceptance and, and the thing that gives you uh, affirmation, I think you still seek it. And my next guest is one of the original Three Stooges. Mm -hmm. Here is Mo Howard. Yeah. Oh. So Dad carried on, alone, still and always a stooge. He began to work on his long-delayed autobiography and hit the road for appearances at film festivals, conventions, and universities. And he just couldn't resist the camera, hitting the talk show circuit with his usual flair. My dad had always played a manic Michelangelo to his band of baggy pants Raphaels, never more so than in the case of Soupy Sales, a spiritual heir to the Stooges' comedy stylings. So when the old master decided to conduct an advanced class in pie throwing on the Mike Douglas show, his pupil was only too willing to participate. That's it. Why don't you go over and give her a nice kiss, okay? Of course, turn about is fair play. And sometimes, as my mom is about to prove, the pie winds up on the other foot. Or is it face? Now, mom's appearance on the Mike Douglas show proves that even without the ailing Larry, my dad wasn't really alone when he came to carrying the Stooge banner. My mother was always willing to show the colors and the advancement of the Stooge cause. How long have you been married now? Uh, 34 years. Boy, that's some while, isn't it? Yes, 34 wonderful years. Traveled with the Stooges wherever they've gone? Yes, every place they went, we went with them. And if Mom was doing her bit for the promotion and the perpetuation of Stoogedom, well, she wasn't the only one. My sister Joni was now beginning her serious immersion into all things stooge. And come to think of it, how could she not? After all, she was the daughter of the master of the stooges and the wife of their manager. It was as if nature and nurture had destined her for the job. And that job was to help create the chronicle of stooge history. Little Joni, as it turned out, had a real talent for writing, an ability to bring a bright and fresh voice to the story of the six men who made up the Three Stooges. My thoughts were how to give back. Uh, my dad, every time he handed out an autograph to a fan that came up to him, he said, you know, if it wasn't for the fans, we wouldn't be here. So I had this feeling that I, I needed 
to help promote that legacy. I had to be able to do something to help keep their name alive. Sometimes working alone, sometimes with writing partners Greg and Jeff Lindberg, Joni put a pen to paper and became an author. Articles started appearing, and then books, each a welcome addition to Stooge Scholarship. Mo's daughter, Joan, picked up the torch and carried it with her books and personal appearances that she made, um, which I think the fans enjoyed immensely, and was very good about keeping the Three Stooges in the hearts and minds of, of the people. And while Joni was sitting in front of the typewriter, our father was sitting in a series of airplane seats. He had become a kind of roving ambassador, a secretary of stooge, if you will. He attended film festivals, conferences, and conventions all over the country. In fact, all over the world, including one in an unlikely hotbed of stooge interest. Japan. Learn the Japanese alphabet. A e u e o, kaki kuke ko, sasi suse so, nani nune no, rari ru re ro, sasi suse so. Hakasata na hamayara wa un. Good. <laughs> well, you take as many kids as there are internationally that watch the Three Stooges. Because it's not just in this country. Is it? Oh God, no. Oh God, no. Ladies and gentlemen. As another attraction, we wish to present those loco Americanos comedians, the Three Stooges. In Latin America, for instance, the Three Stooges are immensely popular. Los Tres Chiflados, Curly, Larry, Mo, and Idiotas de Lujo. They had gone global. Their two reelers and feature films redubbed and redistributed everywhere. <laughs> Their visual, physical comedy, like Charlie Chaplin's a generation before, providing for foreign audiences a language that really needed no words. Though in truth, they got the words anyway. You had kids in Buenos Aires, in Brazil, Asia, Europe, uh, really all over the world, watching La Trois Stooge, The Drive Verruchten. Sambaka Tasho. And if the idea of the Stooges in Japanese strikes you a little odd, well, you ain't heard nothing yet. Ho inventato il super tranquillizzador. Per tranquillizzare tutto l'osca ho prendito l'esitatore de Otto. Ah, ti fa tranquillizzatore, eh? E fa bene per mal di cuore. No. Ti allora prendete. Ya fiaco chi vient? Da che storia che dire con i cittadini americani? L'Amérique n'est pas encore découverte. Mais alors, je peux pas être né. Christophe Colomb lui-même n'est pas encore né. Au parle, Joe. Was hat das zu bedeuten? Au dessus, c'est un flot. Was? Diese Aluten haben ihn aus dem Kerker befreit. Ihr habt es gewagt? Es ist keine Spur von ihm zu finden. Hey, Mojini. Ja? Ich bin jetzt hier bei Ihnen. Du, ja? I was part of the invasion party into Iraq in March of 2003. When I'd go to the market, they would, uh, I would ask for the Three Stooges, but of course I couldn't interpret that in English. So I would actually just hold up a CVD and go whoop, 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 and make that motion. They were like, oh, yeah, boom. And they would actually show me where the Three Stooges were. <laughs> yes, the boys' popularity now spanned the globe. They had transcended their humble beginnings and their vaudeville roots and were winning new fans everywhere. And while Mom, Dad, Joni, Norm, and the Stooges were making like Alexander the Great and conquering the world, what was yours truly doing? Just trying to live a normal life, a life of my own away from showbiz. Now, art had always been my passion and I decided to try to make a career out of it. And since Picasso had already locked up that great artist of the 20th century thing, I went into advertising. And so I moved to New York and became what we now call a madman. And there was one mad twist that still boggles my mind. Back in my Hollywood youth, Harry Cohn had constantly exhaled his fiery breath at his Columbia minions, 
and I came to New York to get away from things like that. So where did I wind up living? On the same damn street where Harry Cohn grew up. What did I have to do to get away from the guy? Move to the moon? Oh well, if Harry's ghost ever wants to visit the old neighborhood, at least he's got a place to stay. I also got married. Like a lot of marriages in those days, or in any days, it didn't work out. But we had a kid, and that worked out just fine. I don't think I will ever be a stooge. At least I don't think I can compete with him. But uh, I have uh, a little stooge at home. She's fantastic. How old is Jennifer now? She's 10 months old. Is she 10 months old? That's fine. She's like 20. Does she recognize uh, Dad on the screen yet? No. I don't think yet. Not quite yet. Not, Not on the, the screen, but when I get into the house, oh, I can imagine. The... <laughs> There's Grandpa, huh? She's got, I think, more expressions than Dad does. Is that so? She's Unbelievable. Really? Different variety dynamite. When I was growing up, all the stories I heard that had anything to do with my dad and Mo, it all had to do with him separating himself, whether it was the story he used to tell his friends about his father being a meter reader for PG&E, or the fact that Mo would try to give him gifts to show his affection, um, and my dad didn't really always want the gifts. So that was sort of the, the mode I grew up with. When I got a sense of who Mo the character was on TV, it seemed very separate from the grandfather that I had known. They didn't seem like the same person at all. Uh, my relationship to the Stooges was almost uh, an extension of my dad's early relationship to them. Can you imagine if you were the son of Mo, the things that people would automatically assume about you? I mean, you'd have to separate yourself to claim any kind of ownership over your personal accomplishments. So I spent most of my adult life trying to separate myself from my birthright. As if I really could. The Stooges were a part of me, although I didn't really know it yet. And they were part of the consciousness of the world. To understand that, all you had to do was look at all the people who proudly called themselves fans. These fans meant everything to the Stooges because they knew that they were nothing without them. They were like an extended family and the Stooges treated them like family, then and always. Well, back in the 1960s, I grew a big, bushy red beard. And my parents didn't know I had. One day they announced they were coming to New York City on business. And somewhere, out of somewhere, I got this idea. What would it be like for me to walk up to my dad in disguise, ask him for his autograph, and he not know who I was? <laughs> well, they told me they were coming in on business one night. We were to meet in Grand Central Station underneath the big clock. So I brought my disguise down to the men's room, changed, came up, trudged up to my dad, bumped him into his shoulder. He looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, hey, are you uh, Mo, one of the Stooges? He says, why, yes. 15 feet away, I see my mother talking to my wife. The eyes, they look just like Paul's. My wife gestures like that. I said, hey, uh, Mo, can I have your autograph? He says, why, sure. Well, who should I make it out to? I'll make it out to, um, to Hoyman. My wife and my mother are starting to laugh. My father gives him a quick look, turns back to me, pulls out the little wallet size autograph with the Three Stooges photo on it, to Herman. Here it is. Gee, thanks, Mo, I really, really like this. And the ladies are now becoming hysterical. Tears are coming down their eyes. Their knees are starting to buckle. My father gives him another look, comes back to me. Mo, I really love you for this. And he walk, I walk, and I trudge out to the exit. Now, what happened next was told to me because I was going down into the basement to change into my normal outfit. My father turns to my wife and my mother and says, how dare you laugh at our fans? How, do, how dare you? They're the ones that made us. And if it wasn't for them, we'd be nobody. 
And then he paused and said, but that was the ugliest son of a bitch I ever saw. Now I'm coming back through a totally different entrance. I come back, as soon as my father sees me, he says, my God, you just missed the wildest looking guy. I said, well, what did he look like? He said he had this wild hair, the wild look. He was a bum. The ladies are now on the floor, totally hysterical and out of control. My father takes a longer look at them. Then he looks back at me and his eyes squint. He says, no. All three of us simultaneously say, yes. Dad turned around in slow motion, grabbed the marble lip of the ticket counter, and slowly collapsed in total hysteria. And that became one of his favorite stories he loved to tell, where the young punk put one over on the old pro. And so, whether they were starstruck kids, or nostalgic adults, or even guys named Paul in disguise, the fans always kept a light burning in the window always kept a welcome mount ready for the Stooges. And you know what? They still do. I had the great thrill of corresponding with Mo. I wrote to him and he sent me very specific and very interesting observations and memories about working with Charlie Chase. And then he was very complimentary about the article when it was finished, uh, which made me feel great. I always felt that if they were my friends, that there would never be a question about what I looked like and who I was. I just knew that. I just knew that there was no, that there was no barrier with the Stooges. And I don't know why I felt that, but I did. Yes, to the fans, the Stooges had become like family. But every family is visited by death. And sometimes death knocks more than once. Hey, step on it, look who's coming! Wow! And in one terrible year, death came calling three times, stealing away the heart and soul of the Stooge family. But, as we will see next time, if that was to be the end, then it would also be a new beginning.